Tom obviously runs the, uh, I think it's the oldest stock exchange in the United States, um, and certainly one of the largest in the world. Um, and in some ways, we're talking about whether the market is at a top this year. The S&P and the Dow hit new records. Um, but in other ways, in a, in a different sense, the market peaked back in 1996. And by that, I mean that in 1996, there were over 7,000 public companies. Uh, today, it's about 3,700, fewer than there were in the 1970s. Um, and a lot of people estimate, you know, the NBER estimated that if we'd continued on the pace that we were back in the 90s, we'd have more than 10,000 public companies today. Um, and not only that, but we're getting many fewer IPOs into the market. Uh, back in 1996, there were uh, over 800 IPOs. Uh, we'll be lucky if we have 200 this year. So against that happy backdrop for the public markets, Tom, I guess I'd like you to maybe explain how that happened and why. Why has the public market shrunk? And we're here today talking about why companies are avoiding it. Sure. Thanks, Telus. And good evening, everyone. I'd be remiss if I didn't just briefly mention uh, thanks to David. I don't know where David went after his remarks. Thanks to David, Chairman Silla, and not just for having me tonight, but for operating this museum. I actually came here many years ago, many years before I was running the New York Stock Exchange. In fact, never could have imagined that would be my future fate. And I remember I got here a little early for an event. And I wandered around, and I, there was a study on the futures markets, which is still here today. There was a study on fiat currency back in this hall, and there was a study on uh, great bank heists in, in history, which was, which was really fun. But the whole of the museum kind of sprinkled in stories of achievement, of success, of entrepreneurial success, and an improvement of quality of life. And it really struck a chord for me while I was wandering around the museum that night, that, that that's what finance is all about. It's not this kind of nerdy uh, concept that so many of us think that it is, maybe even dry. And now I'm running the New York Stock Exchange, and I always take the opportunity when I meet with young people to say, do you know that George Washington was sworn in right here, just 60 paces up the road or so, and at that exact same time, the capital markets were founded, and the New York Stock Exchange was founded, our country and our capital markets have grown up together and have made this country so incredibly special. And I'm very appreciative that David and Chairman Silla, by operating this museum, are keeping that alive for our young people and teaching that lesson to me, but to all of us in the, in the public at large. Just to return to your, your question, um, there are many fewer IPOs now than there were in, in 1996. And the reasons for that are many and varied and not entirely transparent. And so if you look at research on why that is, the professors who gather up that research by and large disagree with one another, or they'll cite one reason over another, and there's never broad agreement. I'd submit that it's for a variety of reasons, and many of them are quite good. And I'll give you an example. I was starting my career around about 1996, and there was this new field called specialty finance that people didn't really talk much about. And it was about new ways of funding companies in the private market, whether through debt or these new things called collateralized debt obligations or collateralized loan obligations. Even the, SB the SBA, the Small Business Association 7A loan program, was still gaining steam and becoming more mature. Private equity firms were growing very, very quickly. They had KKR had gained some notoriety in the mid-'80s, but there were very few others. Now there are hundreds, if not thousands, that are allocating capital to private companies. That's good. That's wonderful. Allocating capital to private companies creates jobs and improves industry. So that's a good reason. A second, a second good reason is that companies increasingly are deciding they don't have to. They just simply don't have to go public. I submit it's, it's connected to that first reason. But they say, you know, hey, I have the financing I need. I have everything I need. I have uh, 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 the currency I need to do acquisitions, so on and so forth. But there is also this nagging issue of increasing cost and regulation on public companies. Regulation is not bad. And in fact, regulation is quite good in the sense that the United States has the most trusted markets in the world. That's why we get so many international listings at the New York Stock Exchange, Alibaba. Just last week, we had Ferrari, which was very fun. They lined up 10 or so of their sports cars out front of the exchange. 
but they're choosing to list the United States because it is a well-regulated market. But there's a balance there. And if you look at Sarbanes-Oxley and you look at Dodd-Frank and you add up all the regulations, it is very expensive to be a public company, and many companies do, do choose not to go public. I don't concern myself with the good reasons that companies don't go public. In fact, I think it's fantastic. But some of those issues that are a little bit more concerning are the types of things that we take up, and we go down to Washington and beyond, and we just counsel legislators, regulators, and our colleagues that we need to have a sensible business environment that encourages companies who will benefit from, from it to go public. So you make an interesting point that, that we talk about the public markets being the place where you go to raise capital, but nowadays companies have a variety of mechanisms, and not just in the debt markets, but in other forms of equity in the private markets. Um, but is there something that's lost? I mean, we're here talking about this. So is there, is there anything that we should be concerned about or worried about that more companies raise funds privately than do so publicly these days? No, I don't, I don't think so. And I know that may seem counterintuitive. I'm the, I'm the president of the New York Stock Exchange. We are the largest exchange in the world. We're the largest listing venue in the world. And we don't make money from companies that don't list and trade on the New York Stock Exchange. And so you might, you might think it's a big concern for me, but it's truly not. We have 2,500 listed companies on the New York Stock Exchange. And adding one more company uh, is a very, it's a rounding error, frankly. We would much rather, if a company needs time to make their company more mature, or maybe have the right management team in place, have more visibility in their business model, we'd much rather they, they take their time to get public. I will note, however, capital goes in cycles, much like everything else. After the financial crisis, try being an entrepreneur in the year 2009 and going out and asking for capital. There wasn't a dollar to be had. That's how cycles work. It was the same thing in 2002 if you were a technology executive. There wasn't a dollar to be had. So these things do come and go. And as quickly as the private market has become flush with capital and new forms of capital, that could reverse tomorrow. I mean, it, it can happen as quickly as that. Some of the new capital that's moved into the private market and has allowed companies not to go public uh, represents new investors, new forms of capital. I'll give you an example. The traditional public market investors, names that you may be familiar with from a 401k or a Roth IRA, such as Fidelity or T. Rowe Price, so on and so forth, they've become big players in investing in private companies. Think Uber, you know, some of the really hot and sexy technology companies. But the amount of capital they're contributing, while large on an absolute basis, relative to all the money they manage, is just a drop in the bucket. And so if, for whatever reason, the market became very turbulent or the private markets less, looked less attractive, they can quickly turn off the spigot and it wouldn't impact their main business in a, in a terribly material way at all. And so we counsel companies to just keep in mind that it's fine to stay private. It's fine to raise money in the private markets, particularly if it's at good valuations. It doesn't come with strings attached. As long as you've prepared for a rainy day and you understand that may not always be the case. Um, it seems like sometimes we're of two minds about the public markets. Um, that on the one hand, we talked about the public markets are a place that are focused on short term, right? We hear about activists every day and they want to make sure that you just you know, why aren't you returning more cash to investors? You know, we're always talking about next quarter's numbers. But sometimes when we talk about the public markets vis-a-vis -vis these private companies and these unicorns, we think of how the private markets are focused on these kind of short-term type deals, right? Where we'll value you at five billion because we think your IPO is coming next year at seven billion or 10 billion. And then they go public and the public markets say, wait a second, you know, you're not quite there yet, so we're going to ratchet back that valuation. So which, which is it? What are, what are the public markets? Are they a venue for short-term thinking, long-term thinking, or something in the middle? It's a good question. Um, I'll highlight a couple things. One, the best CEOs who I've had the privilege to meet, they all take a very long-term view. And, th and that's down the line, if I can think of few of my colleagues are here, and when we kind of sit around and we talk about, wow, the most impressive CEOs who have the best and longest track record and really impressive in person, they're talking about where am I taking my company five years from now, ten years from now. I have no doubt that they have a CFO somewhere you know, behind them who's very focused on making sure they hit that quarter and watching every single cost in their company, so, so it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a luxury. So I think that 
there's certainly a bias towards running the business as if you own it. Running the business as if you started it, you founded it, your kind of life, your life's fortune uh, is at stake, and it's about the uh, uh, the money uh, and the and the kind of quality of life for yourself and your employees that you'll be able to accrue over 20 years. That's certainly the primary objective. But let's face it, the markets are very harsh. Uh, we saw it today. Uh, I won't mention the specific names. New York Stock Exchange listed companies. But we've seen it each of the last three weeks where really big brand name companies would come out and they've kind of just missed earnings and boom, the stock gets whacked 10 to 20 percent. And now all of a sudden you're very, very distracted. You have to run around dealing with upset shareholders and employees. And so you can't afford to blow it in the short term. But at the same time, if you don't keep your eye on the long term, your business is going to be a fad as opposed to a long term trend. Um, we talk a lot about uh, market structure that is like how people trade, how companies are traded, um, in terms of market stability and things like that, are, are, are markets going to break and, and cause disruptions? Uh, but there's also the effect that it might have on a company that wants to go public. And so think when they think about those short-term things, is part of that sort of for, for structural reasons that there are you know, traders who are just trying to make it to the end of the day rather than look at the other quarters. Do you think that, that we should be talking about the IPO market and market structure at the same time, and are there things we can do? I know there's some proposals out there. The Jobs Act tried to address this in some ways um, for for changing market structure, specifically for companies that are thinking about going public. You know, I have, uh, or I had, pardon me, God rest his soul, an uncle Al, and I spoke to my uncle Al in November of 2012. We had just announced that we were buying the New York Stock Exchange. And he was the smartest man I ever knew, and the best investor. And he was 106 years old, completely with it. He was buying and selling stocks up until the day he died in March of the following year, 2013. And I called Al because I was very proud. We had announced we were buying the New York Stock Exchange. And here we were on the cover of the Wall Street Journal. And I thought, Al's going to be so proud. And I wanted to kind of brag. And I called him, and he said, you know, Tommy, I can't really do it. He was down in Purry, Georgia. For any of you from Purry, Georgia, you know that's a deep accent. But he said, you know, Tommy, I don't know what you guys are doing buying that New York Stock Exchange. I don't understand the stock markets anymore. I do not understand what's going on, how these markets are put together or fit together, and I don't feel like I'm getting a fair shake. I think what he said is pretty broadly felt by the investing public. It's certainly not unanimous, nor should it be, but there's a lot of confusion about our market structure today, even two and a half, three years later. People are very confused about what happens from the time I enter an order into my account, how does that order get filled, and what's the role of proprietary trading firms? Am I getting a fair shake in this deal? You know, is somebody looking out for me? And the truth is that you are getting a fair shake. And the retail experience in the markets is better than ever, but perception is reality, and people don't feel that way. And so one of the things that we're most focused on is how do we just simplify the darn thing? How do we reduce the number of order types? How is everybody in the capital markets ecosystem more transparent about how they do business so that the retail public, institutional investors and in individual investors understand that better? And this isn't just benevolence. This isn't just, boy, wouldn't that be great if the public felt better about the public markets. This would help us a great deal at the New York Stock Exchange. One of the first things we spoke about tonight was, why are there fewer companies going public? It's important to remember a robust secondary market for trading. In other words, as many buyers or sellers as you can bring to the market, narrowing the transaction cost for a public company who lists their stock on a public market, the more you can do that, the more who will in turn choose to go public. And so that is an area of focus. I do think it's absolutely an area of concern. And I think it's, it's fair game to, to ask the question, what, what else we can do? Do you think that there should be a new market for, would, would Uncle Al like to see some sort of middle market between being public and being private? I know there have been lots of attempts to do this. Do you think that that's a goal? Or do you think that we're just in a, in a cycle here and we'll see things start to, to 
shift once other factors kind of change? Yeah, I think, I think we're, we're good right now. I, I don't think the last thing we need to do is add more complexity to the, the capital yeah. markets. And there are a lot of people who call for kind of a, a third way. So you have the fully-fledged public markets, such as the New York Stock Exchange. You have the private markets, as we've discussed. And people say, why don't we create a venture layer, which is somehow a, a hybrid of, of, of the two. I'm not exactly sure what that would look like. It's likely unnecessary, wouldn't be terribly additive. Uh, instead, I think we should just continue to develop to make more robust those two markets, including with respect to the public markets, making them more accessible and less costly for smaller companies. So you can get some of those venture benefits uh, or that middle benefit on, on the public markets, such as the New York Stock Exchange. Problem with creating a new third way is now you have an entire new regulatory regime. You know, you have lawyers who are going to specialize in this. You have exchanges who are going to specialize in this. And now you've just layered an entire blanket of cost on the industry that those companies would have to bear. Well, Tom, um, thank you so much for thank joining you. us to discuss the public markets. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs>